Hi, and welcome to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast presented by Wolf Precision Incorporated, where we learn about and share long range shooting and custom rifle building. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. Hi and welcome to episode 72 of Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. In this episode, we are going to be talking about and making the case for the 22 Creedmoor. So this is a cartridge that we are working on and have been working with for a while. And I want to share with you some thoughts on why I think this actually may be the next big thing. So without further ado... Here we go. All right, before we get started, we would like to say special thanks to Krieger Barrels. Krieger is a maker of fine cut rifled barrels. Uh, We work with Krieger a lot here, and they have some really great products coming online that you can purchase immediately for a two to three day turnaround time. So you can go over to KriegerDirect.com where you can purchase barrels that are in stock, ready to ship. They also have a sales page where they periodically post different barrels that they have for sale. So you can go over to KriegerDirect.com and visit what they have in stock and ready to ship today or go over to KriegerBarrels.com and see their online inventory. So that is KriegerDirect.com or KriegerBarrels.com today. All right, so making the case for the 22 Creedmoor. I've actually been really excited about doing this particular podcast because it is the first caliber really in a long time that I've seen like this this light come on that this caliber is checking a lot of boxes, both as a shooter, as a hunter, as a marksman, as a reloader, as a competitor. And, you know, you always hear people talking about, well, you know, the magic unicorn caliber, whatever they want to, how to think of it. But this one has legs. And I'm bringing it up here because There's been a lot of new calibers come out for the last, whatever, 30 years. Every year, there's a new kid on the block or several new kids on the block. And a lot of it is designed to to try to get you to purchase a new rifle based in this caliber that's all hot routed up. And, of course, the manufacturers do their rounds and they go to every writer that they can find who I a lot of times consider more paid advertisers. And, you know, they'll write a blazing article on it and, you know, they'll be publishing all the magazines and, you know, they stir up all this interest that, oh, my gosh, this is it. This is the caliber. And, you know, I'm almost 50. So after years and years and years and years and years and years and years of seeing this and just eventually watching a lot of them just fade away and go away, you just don't get as excited anymore. Like you see it. You're like, yeah, let's see if it's got legs and staying power. Because for us as shooters and reloaders, like the 6.5 Short Action Ultra Mag, which I thought was a great cartridge that sort of started fading away. You've got lots of great calibers that have come out over the years, but all of a sudden they start to go away. And all of a sudden reloading components become hard to find. Uh, brass gets hard to find. You don't see the data coming out. Sometimes you don't get uh, the support. That, that you need to keep working with that cartridge. So the mass public buying into it starts to wean down, and then all of a sudden they're doing one run a year of brass. And so when you buy into a cartridge like a new caliber coming out, you know, I always look at it, is it going to have staying power? Does it have a sticky factor? That's how I like to look at it. I guess that's a better word to use. Is it going to be around? So the 22 Creedmoor has been around actually for quite a long time. I believe it first started getting necked down and used a lot in early 2012, 13. You started to see some custom rifle builders offering it. You started to see some data come out on it. And for maybe the last two years, we've been playing with it here, especially as soon as Hornady released 22 Creedmoor Brass. Peterson is releasing 22 Creedmoor Brass. Alpha Munitions is releasing 22 Creedmoor Brass. So that tells me that there's going to start to see some custom ammunition come online which you know word of caution there but you also start to see maybe some factory offerings that's a big deal for us as builders uh, because some of our clients just don't reload but let's talk about why the 22 creedmoor just might have that sticky factor to become really the caliber and i mean the caliber that does a lot of great things really well 
Let's talk about the hunting side first. So when you get into these types of calibers, especially in the 22 range, you don't see a lot of hunting cartridges built. Early on, the 22 Creedmoor was adopted as a varmint round. So you, you've seen a lot of coyote hunters and, and woodchuck hunters and you know varmint hunters were buying into it because they needed something flat and something to hit hard. One of the things that was missing in the arsenal of the 22 caliber range was something like the 22 Creedmoor. So we used 223s for trainers here at the shooting school for a decade. They were long-throated, so the bullets would seat out of the case. We could get good case capacity. We could we could throat it properly, and we could shoot a 75-grain bullet to 1,000 yards. It was amazing to watch. But And, and I've actually ran that in matches for fun, um, 223, 308 matches, for example. I uh, ran one about two years ago. I think I took first place in the 223 category, uh, but was still beat out in the 308 overall for top scores of the match. And I lost some points simply because the 223 just doesn't hit the steel hard enough at the extended range targets for spotters to score them. So you, you get a hit, but it hits so faint and so lightly that, you know, even the best spotters with a little shake in the spotting scope won't see it. And so you just get a no call. That happens. The 22-250 was one of my favorite varmint rounds. And I'm a varmint hunter, so it's just one of my favorite things to do. And it filled a category of varmint hunting and we even did some fast twists so in other words the 22250 shooting 75 grain bullets for example amazing to a thousand yards however though not quite the right design it still didn't quite have the case capacity the 22250 has a very short neck so you get deep into the case or you don't have a lot of neck area to grab the bullet and the shoulder design on the 22250 well, it's known to stretch cases. So what will happen is you'll form donuts. The the twenty two two fifty was always designed to shoot forty and fifty, you know, fifty two and sixty grain varmint bullets, and so the cases stretch easy. Uh, they have to be trimmed quite often. Um, just wasn't perfect. So like, would I run it in a match? I thought about it. I really did. I thought you know, shooting a seventy five grain A max back at the day. It hit pretty hard at a thousand yards. You could see it. It was efficient, super low recoil, but wasn't quite there yet, you know. So we built some fast twist twenty two two fifty. Some are still on the line today, being used for varmint hunting, but uh, not quite there to where it was like, wow, that's really something special. Now enter the twenty two Creed more. What does it do? Well, for starters, it has the proper design to grip the bullet long enough. And with enough surface area that that it's going to be accurate and it's got the proper shoulder design so the cases aren't going to stretch, hopefully not forming the donuts at the at the base of the next shoulder junction as quickly, which some of the cartridges are known to do. So it's inherently accurate because of the case design. Has a little bit more case capacity compared to the 22250, and it's still efficient. Think of it as maybe a more efficient version of a 22 Swift. The thing with the 22 Creed, though, that's fascinating is that now it's being supported by bullet selections that just weren't around 10 or 15 years ago, or at least not a lot of them. For example, the 88 grain ELD match. That was the sticking point for me. An 88 grain bullet. Out of a 22 caliber, super mild load, under 3,200 feet per second, 6 mils to 1,000 yards. Amazing. We would run these to 1,000 yards with 6.5 Creedmoors on the line. And at little 22 Creed, with no really felt recoil, I mean just super fast, super efficient to work with, on steel, it was hard to tell the difference whether that steel was just hit by a 6.5 Creedmoor or the 22 Creedmoor. That is impressive. Where the 22 Creedmoor is now going to start taking over is the fact that it's going to be supported by 80.5 and, and 85.5 grain burgers, by 90 grain Sierras, by 90 grain A tips with a BC of 585. That's where the 140 AMAXs started. 
So one of the things that kept the 22 calibers from coming up and being a real hunting caliber for a medium-sized game and a real match cartridge that could compete was the lack of the high BC heavy bullets. And simply put, there wasn't a lot of people looking for them. You know, most of your varmint hunters that were shooting 223s and 22 250s, shooting one, two, three, 400 yards, shot 40 and 50 grain bullets. So there wasn't a market for them to develop these bullets. Now it's here. And boy, is it amazing. So as a hunting cartridge, I think this is going to be absolutely incredible. And I say that for several different reasons. Number one, when you're looking for a hunting cartridge for a new shooter, now you've got bullets like Barnes 77 grain solids that will blow completely through an animal. You've got a huge variety of hard-hitting heavy bullets for 22 caliber that could decimate medium-sized game at longer ranges. So, for example, the 22 Creed has nearly a thousand foot pounds of energy at 600 yards. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. The 243 years ago was a very popular, quote unquote, kids round or beginner shooter or introductory cartridge for deer. I know if you go back to look at some of your old reloading manuals, like say, for example, Redding, one of the writers in there on the 243 said that it was one of his favorite mule deer cartridges shooting an 85 or 90 grain bullet. But where the 243 fell off at one, two and 300 yards was the fact that those 80, 90 grain bullets had no ballistic coefficiency. So when you shot them at distance, they literally would just go out and it would be like throwing a softball compared to a baseball compared to a wiffle ball. You know, the 243 shooting an 85 grain bullet with absolutely no BC to carry it is like throwing a wiffle ball as hard as you can. It's going to go really fast out to two, three, four hundred yards and it just falls off. But as soon as you get the BC behind it, and in an 88 grain 22 caliber board of a BC of 545 is amazing. A thousand foot pounds of energy at 600 yards. You'll read articles that say that you need a minimum of a thousand foot pounds of energy to shoot an elk. Even if you say, okay, we need 1500 foot pounds. This little 22 caliber has nearly 1500 foot pounds of energy at 300 yards. Now, let me go a couple steps further with this and why I think this is really important as a hunting round and why I think a lot of people should really consider it. At 350 yards, we have plates at the shooting school that are half-inch AR-500 plates, so they are hard. They have been shot with everything you can imagine under the sun, including full metal jackets. There isn't a dimple on those plates. We started shooting the 22 Creedmoor with an 88 grain ELD match. And I have pictures. I will post it up on our Facebook page tonight. It dimpled the AR-500 plates. That at 350 yards is amazing. We think because the core is so narrow and long, think about like why the 6.5 Creedmoor or 6.5 bullets and 140 grainers were such great killing machines for big game hunting was they were narrow lead cores, really long bullets. So they would blow through and do tons of damage. Well, now you've got a little brother version of that, of an 88 grain bullet that's just as long and even a little bit narrower lead core. So in other words, it doesn't have the frontal area when it hits something that just blows up. It drives and, and concentrates that energy on a much smaller point. And man, it was amazing. Dimpled the AR-500 plates at 350 yards. Amazing. Go a couple steps further. Uh, female shooters, new shooters, young shooters. I was at the range with a gentleman who had taken his then 15-year-old daughter out with a new 243. And this is probably going back 15 years ago. You know, gone are the days, thank God, of the old 30-30 leave reaction to the 12-year-old that kicked like a micro 308. But still, you know, he, his mind thought was, well, 243 is a great deer cartridge right wrong for a 15 year old girl was really a bad idea why because he bought a very cheap lightweight 243 and then he went out and bought 105 grain bullets or 100 grain soft nose or whatever they were and that rifle kicked like a mule 
it kicked it kicked like crazy and i'm and the the I, the girl shot a couple shots and of course he's frustrated because he bought the rifle and he thinks that she should be able to shoot it and and, and his name was mike and i'm like hey mike i said i want you to shoot that rifle he shot it and he got off he was like holy crap i said yeah it he said, I can't believe a 243 kicks like that. And I'm like, well, yeah, they, they do with a 100 grain bullet. They absolutely do. And and then combine that with a very lightweight rifle. So when people ask, like, what's a great hunting cartridge? The 6.5 is awesome in maybe a medium weight barrel, lighter weight rifle for newer er shooters, but not inexperienced or young shooters. My daughter started off with a 223. And we loaded uh, 75 grain bullets to sneak out and try to shoot a deer at 100, 200 yards. But that was sort of its limits. Now, all of a sudden, we've got a 22 Creedmoor that kicks like a 22 caliber rifle should. No recoil. It's not going to scare the daylights out of them. That's going to deliver 1,000 foot-pounds of energy on an animal at 600 yards. My God, at two and 300 yards, decimating. I did some research before I started this podcast, trying to find some hunting forums where people are posting up their hunting with a 22 Creed. And you'll see stories of, of young kids shooting deer and blowing through both lungs and shredding the heart at two and 300 yards. Easy. Then you've got the solids, like you got the Barnes bullets and the tougher bullets that, you know, I don't know, you take a 77 grain Barnes bullet. It should be able to drive completely through a mule deer at five, six hundred yards. Now it doesn't have the higher BCs like the eighty-eight grain ELD matches or ninety grain A tips, so it's gonna slow down relatively quicker. But it's a solid. It's gonna mushroom and it's gonna blow a hole clean through the animal. It's gonna break bone. That's what these things are designed to do. And the beauty of it is is you can spot your own shot. The beauty of it is your follow up shots are gonna be insanely fast. So it's bang, bang. When we're shooting out to a thousand yards, one of the things that the customers' responses were is that they would we would let them shoot the twenty two Creed, and they would get off the gun like with smiles from ear to ear, like looking at you, like what was that? Because when you shoot, you can actually the bullet gets there quicker. It's like bang, clink, rather than bang, clink. You know, like a like a six five would, and so you actually recognize that the bullet's getting there that much faster. Now, why is this important for hunting applications for what we do? Well, here's the problem when you get into hunting, right? And this goes back to varmint hunting, and and I'll I'll give up some case and points here to try to make this point along. Coyote hunters and varmint hunters are a different breed, and they they try to get really fast, accurate, flat shooting cartridges, not because they're trying to beat anything in the submission. It's just that sometimes there's different unknown distances or variables that get involved. So for example, 20 years ago, we used to mill a lot of targets and shoot a lot of matches. Guys at distance in a 308 making a 10, 20 yard error will shoot over and under the target. Range finders bouncing off the ground behind the animal because you're looking slightly downhill at it. So you're shooting the rangefinder over its back and it's bouncing off something behind it, giving you a 15 or 20 yard error is a five and a half inch high shot. So if you watch like some of your long range quote unquote hunting videos that have been published over the last 20 years, and if you watch enough outdoor TV, you'll see this quite often, is they get shot high in the back. Or it's close to the spine. And of course, the animal drops like a lead brick. It's bang. And of course, the high fives continue and handshakes and, you know, but that's not where they were aiming in most cases. What typically will happen is, and we see this in varmint hunting a lot, is that the laser rangefinder bounces off the tree line behind the animal or the mound and you'll shoot right over top its head, right over its back. Same thing happens in big game hunting. You know, you bounce off just over the animal or just under the animal, however it goes, but you wind up with a small air, 10, 15, 25 yards, and you're five and a half inches high now on your dialed dope. So you're spining them or hitting them real high on the shoulder or you're missing them. Take the 22 Creed, for example. At 600 yards, we did the math. We have the dope. One to possibly two-tenths of a mil with a 25-yard error. 
So one tenth of a mil out to like three to four hundred yards. And when we did the six hundred yard comparison, it was one tenth on the lower end going from five seventy five to six, and it was two tenths going from so it's splitting the difference. So let's just call it one point five mils. On a six five creed, shooting a much higher BC board at six four five, you were averaging about two to three tenths. What that means to us as hunters is that rather than being five and a half inches high on an air of 25 yards, you're now half that, two and a half maybe. Well, two and a half inches high on an animal, still a really good kill shot. Five and a half inches high, high or low, keep in mind, could be the game changer. So we see this in matches a lot through the years where – uh, a lot of the cartridges, especially at long range, whether they milled them or hit them with a laser, their misses weren't necessarily always because of the wind. It was a lot of times just over the top or just under. You'll see this just over the top, just under. A small air in a yardage, especially when you start talking about longer distance shots, is a compounding problem. So the flatter that you can get that with a heavy high BC bullet, the better you are. So it, is it going to save your hunt? There's a good chance because this is a real common thing you'll see guys do. They'll shoot high or shoot low. Most of the time it's high. It's right over the top. It's right over the back. This is common. So that is an error of 20, 25 yards. The other thing I think which is fascinating about a hunting cartridge is the fact of how much energy this thing can put on target. So I, I'm building my own personal hunting rifle, and as we speak, we have two of these that are going to go on the school rifles this year. Uh, we're going to shoot 75 graners for a while. We're going to play with some 88 graners. We're going to play with some 90 grain A-tips. Uh, yes, we, we bought 1,000 A-tips to put on the line and just to play with it, and I'm going to try to shoot this in some matches this coming year. And I tell you, uh, but as a hunter, oh my gosh, Super low recoil, you suppress it, it's like shooting a 223. And even in a really light mountain rifle, a young kid could shoot this. Shoot it well. You could take down to like a 70 grain Barnes or something like that. And my gosh, no muzzle break. If you're suppressed, even better. How about ease of reloading? Oh man, you got to check a lot of boxes here because uh, we've been playing with reloads for this. For about two, maybe two and a half years, uh, myself and one of our instructors, and it's easy to reload for. I mean, we have multiple, multiple bullets, all shooting awesome. The guns really don't care as far as like, yeah, we could critique it and, and try to get those those groups even down. I mean, some of the smallest groups I've ever fired in my life. Uh, we just delivered one to Texas, for example. I mean, it, it shot in, in the twos and threes with, with no effort. But one of the smallest groups I ever shot in my life, period, was with a twenty two Creed. And uh, it was a five-shot group at our home range. I was there with my dad. I was there with Walt. And we were just playing with the cartridge. And it was just like, my gosh, I, I don't think – it was one of those magical calibers, sort of like where the three hundred eight's at. The three hundred eight is one of those great cartridges that – if you can put powder and a bullet in there, there's a good chance it's going to shoot okay. You know, Now you can fine-tune it and get some great shooting loads, but it's not picky. It's not a finicky cartridge to reload for. However, though, if you do your research, there are lots of cartridges out there that are super high maintenance, really picky on seating depth, powder charges. And so one of the things that is sort of um, a box that you have to check in order for me to really buy into a cartridge is just how easy is it to reload for? Is it picky? I mean, can you shoot lots of different bullets, lots of different powders? Like from what we're reading online and just what we've played with here, I mean, you've got people reloading the Hodgkin's H1000, Reloader 26, Reloader 22. Um, you got people shooting, you know, Varget and H4350. I mean, there's just all of these powders and all these different loads people are shooting and getting great results. You're not really reading a lot where guys are like, man, I'm struggling to find anything that will shoot through this. Pretty cool. But for a hunting rifle, I, I got to say, I, would I shoot an elk with it? Uh, with a solid? I mean, I wouldn't recommend it as an elk cartridge, but I do know people 
um, not personally, but I know somebody whose dad has shot elk with 22 250s, uh, shooting them in the head at 200 yards or 250 yards. So um, not that I'm an advocate of going out and shooting elk with 22 calibers, so don't don't flame throw me on this one. But with a 77 grain solid bullet that will just keep pushing through, would it blow through an elk? Well, I just watched the dimple, you know, AR 500 plates at 350 yards. I guess it probably would. Shoot him in the neck, ah, dead, dead right there. How about mule deer? Flat shooting, long range, 1,000 foot-pounds of energy, 600 yards. Hey, what's not to like? Why not? How are the other bullets going to perform when they come online? Is there heavy bullets coming out? Are we going to see a 95-grain or 100-grain 22-caliber bullet soon? I don't know, but we've got 90-grainers now. Now, let's talk about match shooting because, you know, like I said, this caliber has to check a lot of boxes for me to buy into it. And I have to say, if you can tell by me coming on to the podcast talking about it, uh, not only am I hooked on it, but we've got people buying them. Uh, we've probably sold five within the last 30 days. Now, how about for a match caliber? This is where I think this is a big box for me. Because the 22 caliber always had a chance at really dominating, especially tactical type matches out to a thousand yards. Why? Because what's the one thing they're all doing? They're trying to control recoil. And now in PRS type shooting, they're trying to control it even more than ever. Where, you know, back in the day, a 14 or 16 pound rifle was considered heavy. These were field guns. You know, we were shooting tactical and sniper matches, you know, carrying our stuff all day. Now, because it's more of stages where you're walking up to and then throwing your gun up on the line and multiple stages from one location, you're not really walking around for miles, you know, day in, day out. You know, now they're making 22 pound guns to control the recoil on 6 mm cartridges. So, how important is recoil? Well, it's huge, especially when you take into consideration how fast. Some of these stages are being asked to be run at. So they're very short time limits with multiple targets, quick follow-up shots, sometimes different distances. So this is a compounding factor. Number one, way less recoil. Number two, maybe you don't need quite a heaviest gun. Maybe you'll be able to shoot it better. Maybe you'll be able to transition between stages faster. How about number three, flatter trajectory. You could be off a couple yards and still hit the plate. Number four, now you can spot your shots with a 22 caliber bullet. We were shooting them to over a thousand yards and it was hitting the plate as hard as a 6.5 Creedmoor. From our perspective, it was. And it was shocking. We were like, wow, that is really cool. The fact that the rifle just, boom, suppressed, way it goes, clang. And you can hear it, you can see it, you get points for it. That's how it works. So... I really do think that this could become one of those magical cartridges that that could really start playing big in PRS. It's been around a while. There are guys getting tooled up to shoot it. These are early adopters, seeing how they do. But I got to say, I'm one of them, and, and I'm sort of sold hook, line, and sinker. I think this is going to be a big one. Now, when you get into these 22 caliber shooting heavy bullets, you got to talk about barrel life, right? This is a big deal. You know, you'll hear people talk about it all the time. Well, you know, you know these these fast burning cartridges burning up barrels at six hundred rounds. I don't think the twenty two Creed is going to do that. Our experience here over the last two years says that we should be able to actually beat the six Creed for a round count. I think at the shooting school that we should be between fifteen hundred and two thousand rounds before we'll pull it off the line. Now, to put that in perspective, the 6.5 Creedmoors that we shoot now come off the line at 2,000 rounds. We shoot a little bit faster. Sometimes the barrels don't get to cool down as much, so they retain the heat. So we shoot 10-shot drills sometimes. We're shooting, you know, 900 and 1,000 yards. We're giving guys lots of chance uh, to shoot multiple targets. So uh, the, the round count, consistent round count through volleys is higher than what you would typically see practicing or training so a longer sustained amounts of fire put way more heat in them and just chew them up faster. And so the 6.5 Creedmoors, every 2,000 rounds, we pull the barrels. I really don't see the fire cracking and stuff that happens quickly in the 6.5 Creeds. I'm not seeing it. I have a bore scope. I've been keeping an eye on multiple rifles. And are they showing some wear and tear? Yeah, but actually, in my opinion, 
no worse than what the 223s we ran at the school. The 223s, you know, shooting a 75 grain bullet, they would fire crack just like it. They would get the wear and tear in the throat just like every other cartridge. They're not immune to it. And so to my surprise, it was less than what I thought it would be. I really thought that the wear and tear would be more than what it was. And I'm beginning to think that I don't think the round count is going to be a killer on this at all. I don't think it's going to be a 6.5 PRC getting six or 800 rounds through it or however. I don't think 12 to 1500 rounds is unrealistic. And, you know, we pull the, the 6.5 creeds when they start running about a half a minute and you'll get an occasional flyer. Then it's time to pull them off. The 22 creeds, we'll see where they go. Sometimes they just last. And even though the throats are getting worn out a little bit, they still keep shooting. And so we're going to run them real hard this year. We're going to run them and see how long we can get out of them at the school where we, we're going to put massive amounts of rounds through these guns. So does it bother me that, that you might not get the 6.5 round count? It doesn't bother me as much at all, actually. Uh, it's just simply because we know this is a wear and tear part, and I, I enjoy shooting. I'm going to shoot these barrels out regardless of the caliber, and so I might as well shoot a caliber that's just, I got to admit, just fun to shoot. Last thing I want to talk about the 22 Creed, it's getting supported heavily. So you're seeing other brass makers. Hornady makes 22 Creed brass now. Um, Alpha Munitions is making small rifle and large rifle brass for it as we speak. So we have had some of their brass here, and we ordered some small rifle primer brass for the 22 Creed. We're excited to get those. We'll have uh, some coming for the school this year. And as well as Peterson is making, and they have been, making 22 Creed more brass for a while. Uh, there is some die selections out there, so it's not a wildcat anymore. It's not hard to find reloading components and reloading supplies for it. They're actually getting really, really available. Now, here's the kicker, and I don't want to shoot myself in the foot on this one. The components for the 22 Creed are awesome because guess what? They're available. Bullets are available. Now, I don't want to throw flags up in the air and mess myself over on this one, but the cool part about the 22 Creed, it shoots bullets that aren't typical for a 223, for a 22 250, for a 22 Swift, unless they're really long throated. They don't shoot these in AR type platforms, they don't feed in those length magazines. So 95% of your shooters that are shooting 22 calibers do not look above 75 grain bullets to purchase. Which means as I am speaking, there are 80 and a half grain burgers for sale right now. There are 90 grain Sierra Match Kings for sale right now. There are 90 grain A-tips available right now. Why? Because when they get the big batches in, they last a while. They aren't in that batch of 68 grain and 75 grain and 52 grain bullets that you're seeing shot in AR platforms in 223, 556, 22250. Uh, they're not in that group. And those people can't really use these. They're not made for those types of rifles. And so the coolest part about it is, is that there's components actually available that you can purchase right now. Try to five 6.5 bullets. I mean, they're not even taking back orders at half these places. Try to find 308 bullet. So it's become this little segment that's overlooked that's got components readily available to reload. Now, you still have to find your powder. And, you know, you could use large rifle or small rifle primers if you use alpha munitions brass. So, so whatever primers you had available, you could maybe order the brass and use the primers that you have. But the bullets are there. Why? Because they're not mainstream. They're, they fall out the norm of the masses that use 22 caliber ammunition, that reload 22 caliber ammunition. They fall out of that, that mass area in the middle that is the most popular and in most cases are completely unusable to a lot of these people. Like you, the 90 grainers in an AR, nope, ain't going to see it. So for us as shooters, it leaves this little area of light that, hey, these are going to be continually available because – they're just not that popular for the people that shoot 22 calibers. They're outside the norm of the weight, bullet weight that people shoot. Most people will pass them up. They have no use for them. We have a use for them. So as a reloader, 
I just bought bullets this morning. Amazing. Uh, so one of the many reasons why the 22 Creed is coming online for the shooting school, not just because we love it, right? Not just because every time we have a customer shoot it, they come off the rifle with a grin from ear to ear and looking at you like, what the heck was that? Dude, that was awesome, right? Um, we've had, I'm going to have to give Walt a raise because he took the 22 Creed to King of the Mountain and two or three people there bought one. They shot his rifle. They're watching him shoot it. They're like, what the heck are you shooting? And they shot it and they're like, oh my God, what is that? But the other cool part about it is, is we have readily available components that we can reload all summer long uh, that we can use for the shooting school. And we've got the availability of both small rifle and large rifle primers. So you can get the brass with small rifle primers or large rifle primers. And so we've got a good variety of primers that, you know, if, if you're stuck with a bunch of large rifle primers, you could get that brass for it. If you got a whole pile of small rifle primers, you could get brass for that. And you could use it, you could buy bullets, and then just do your hunt for your powders and stuff. But that's the other thing is, uh, you know, we're putting them on the line because, A, we think they're a hoot to shoot. Uh, we're not worried about the round count at the shooting school. If we get 1,500 rounds, I'd be happy. If we get 2,000 rounds, I mean, we'll know by the end of the year because we'll be shooting barrels out on a regular basis. But to us, it's not that big of a deal. Like I said, we just spin the ace off. We pull another barrel down. We spin the ace on, and it goes back onto the barrel action. And literally, the next day, it's back on the line. It's it's a it's a usable part of the barrel that realistically, now as a consumer, we can see, okay, hey, I'm okay with replacing the tires on my car. I'm not okay with throwing the rims and tires out together every time I have to do it, but now it's just the tires. I'm okay with that, and that's sort of where the barrel comes into play with this. So I don't want to go too far on the 22 Creed and say that, oh my gosh, everybody has to rush out and buy one. I don't think it's for everyone. I think some guys in hunting would, you know, hey, you, you've got to take a – you know, 300 wind mag for mule deer. We've read articles where that's the minimum cartridge you can shoot. And if you believe that, that's okay. We're not saying that we're right, you're wrong, or that we're an advocate that these this is the caliber to go out and shoot every big game animal in North America. It's not. I think, honestly, it's just up to the individual himself and what he feels comfortable with and how he can shoot the rifle and shot placement and kill that animal right there where it stands. You know, I think a lot of that is just your personal preference as well as your personal abilities as well as your personal limits you know how far you want to shoot what's the distances you think you're going to shoot at and all that so uh 22 creed we think you're going to see this come on mainstream i think a lot of people are going to start seeing the light of what a real 22 caliber bullet can do when it's made right and it's got the heavy bullets now made for it i always thought the 223 or a 22 caliber had a place in long range shooting i always believed it made a great hunting round i always thought it would be a fantastic match gun if it would only be supported with a better case that could have more capacity to run it efficiently as well as giving us the shooters a bigger selection of heavy high bc bullets like you have in the 6.5 you know you got 155 and 150 some grain 60 grain bullets available for the 6.5 now we've got 90 grainers coming out for the 22 cows it really levels the playing field a lot last thing i want to touch base on is thousand yard dope and this is where i'll sort of end the segment on the 22 creed so I'm running this off of our average 6.5 Creedmoor. That's what we shot in the shooting school for the last couple of years. Shooting a 140 grain ELD match at an average speed of 2750. So that would be average. And we had some guns that would shoot a little bit higher than that and some guns that would shoot a little bit less. But in doing that, our 1,000 yard dope on average was about 8 mils. Shooting the 22 Creed with an 88 grain ELD match and a ballistic coefficient of let's just say 545. We are running under 3200. We have pushed it more than that, but we we found a really nice low pressure load that's just under 3200, keeping it legal for PRS, by the way. Our thousand yard dope is 6.2 mils, almost 25% less. All right, so now we jump this up. Final thing on the 22 Creed to the 90 grain A tip going just under 3,200 3, feet per second at the altitude we shoot at the school, which is 2,000 feet. So we're using 3,180 out of a 26 inch tube, right? At 1,000 yards, 6 mils, 25% less dope 
than the 6.5 Creedmoor shooting a 140 grain ELD match. At 1,700 yards, you are still moving at 1,177 feet per second. At 1,700 yards. 950 foot-pounds of energy at 700 yards. That is amazing. All in a gun that's going to recoil like the mildest 22-250 or like cartridge to shoot. We'll try to post up some video this year coming from the shooting school when we get to 22 Creeds on the line. We'll try to post up some more on it. We're huge supporters of it. We think it's going to be a great thing. We've got some carbon fiber barrels coming from IBI Barrels. That's One of them is going to be my personal hunting rifle in 22 Creed. I'm excited about that as well. And of course, if you have any questions on it, always feel free to give us a call. Contact us here at Wolf Precision. Our email is contact at wolfprecision.net and be glad to help you in any way possible. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. I hope it spurs up some interest to go and do some research on the 22 Creed and ask lots of questions. Uh, We think it's going to be a fantastic cartridge. Uh, We are working, by the way, on, and we got great reception for the podcast where we're talking about Made in America and talking about the conditions of the outdoor industry in the United States and our U.S. industry. So we have several interviews lined up, and we'll be spreading them out through the course of the year with multiple companies that still make and manufacture their great products here in the good old United States of America. We are proud to have them on the show, and we uh, really do appreciate them taking the time to come on and talking about their product here. Uh, Before I let you go, I do want to say a quick thanks to Trigger Tech Triggers. They are one of the sponsors of the show. Trigger Tech makes lots of great triggers for many different platforms. We use them here. We recommend them. We use them at the shooting school. And I always tell guys, if you're going to put a replacement trigger in your rifle, then do yourself a favor and put the best in that you can get. And we really do believe that it's Trigger Tech. So you can stop over and see them at TriggerTech.com today. Also, we'd like to thank MDT. MDT is a proud sponsor of the show as well. They are great partners. We use a lot of their chassis here at the school. They also have some really new and exciting things coming up. Uh, from the ACC chassis uh, to the Oryx chassis, we really like the line of stocks. They've done a great job. And um, it's just something that, that we believe. And we've actually built hunting rifles on the Oryx chassis for customers to take out elk hunting, believe it or not. And they come back loving it. It's a great, great chassis for under $400. Can't say enough good things about it. So you have those as options as well. Now they have different coward skins and some things like that. But you can stop over and see more about MDT at MDTTAC.com. That's MDTTAC.com. Stop over and take a look at those today. So I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to join us on the podcast. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us here at the show. My name is Jamie Dotson. I'm your host. And you're listening to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. (laughs) Thank you.